Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genetics and Genomics Virtual Event. My name is Karen Miga. I'm an assistant research scientist at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And today I'll be presenting on completing the human genome, the progress and challenge of satellite DNA assembly. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with satellite DNAs, satellite DNAs are a type of tandem repeat. This is a type of sequence that I'm showing you here, where you have a stretch of A, T, Cs, and Gs, and a head to tail orientation. However, unlike the tandem repeats you find throughout the human genome, the ones I'm going to focus on today are found in a head to tail orientation for millions of bases. And these huge um, areas of tandem repeats are typically found to be enriched in the human genome around the subtelomere, the rDNA, and the pericentromeric and centromeric regions, which will be the focus of my talk. And these particular regions, because they're so dense in repeats, are absolutely why our assembly efforts fail in these regions and why they become the last regions of our genomes to be completed, to reach this comprehensive telomere to telomere assemblies. Now, I don't want you to leave my, my talk thinking that satellite DNAs are just this tandem head to tail repeat, but rather the regions of the genome that they occupy are pretty specialized genomic ecosystems for repeats. For one, in the slide I'm showing you, you have two very different tandem arrays. One could be orange, as I'm showing you here, the other one's in red. You also have these arrays that are interrupted by transposable elements, or what I'm calling recent TEs, which are shown in purple. And also the satellite arrays are thought to be book-ended or, or flanked by these centric transitions that are enriched for segmental duplications. Now, understanding the composition and the organization of these sites are important not only for just a genomics view of assembly, but also in understanding their functional roles. For example, we know the satellite DNAs are associated with um, centromere function, and there are studies that would support the idea that the composition and the sequence organization of these sites are actually driving some of our best models of how kinetochores assemble and also how the pericentric heterochromatin is being organized. So getting accurate maps of these regions is really important for driving fundamental biological questions forward. One important thing to take away as well is that when you think about these repeat jungles or these very unique repeat ecosystems, you can think about the differences not only between one individual, but actually two. And we know that these particular regions are expected to vary quite considerably in human population, as I'm showing you in this um, slide, you could have individual one where you have a certain size of the orange array, and then an individual two, you can see that, that particular array is then expanded, you may have inversions, and so all of a sudden you have a mixture of repeats that look quite different between two individuals. So it kind of opens a whole new world of studying sequence variants that could have function and association with human disease in centromeric regions. And I want to emphasize that the sequence variation we've known about for quite some time, and it really presents an unknown and unexplored um, region of the human genome. However, a long time ago, this used to be a, a huge focus for human geneticists and cytogeneticists, where we could see these types of variations from space. Here I'm showing you one heterochromatic allele, allele one versus allele two on chromosome nine. And previous studies going back to the late 70s and late 80s and all the way up to the early 90s, which would show that these particular satellite alleles may in fact have a role in chromosome segregation and aneuploidy rates. And if we begin to dive into some of these high resolution population data sets and we begin to study some of the most frequent satellites that we know exist in the human genome, for example, alpha satellite, which I'll talk about later in my talk, as well as human satellites two and three, we can see that these satellites actually take up a large proportion of the human genome. Here on, on, your, on my right, I guess on your right as well, you can see the frequency of alpha satellite or the percentage of alpha satellite in the entire genome broken down by the different populations and the thousand genome data sets. And you see on average, you're looking at about 3% of the human genome is defined by these alpha satellite repeats. And if we start thinking about human satellites two and three, although we do see a shift towards 2% of the genome, there's a tail. And so there's certain individuals that we hypothesize in the genome have a much larger amount of these particular satellite repeats. And so understanding uh, this type of variation is very important moving forward. And I would say it's not only important for understanding just structural variants that exist in the human population from the aspect of just um, categorizing or finishing the human genome alone, but also, like I had mentioned, for understanding how these regions function, may it be through centromere um, function, as I had mentioned earlier, also how these particular regions can drive our understanding of evolution and selection on the chromosome level, since these are sites that are important for structure as well as segregation. 
also understanding how to move into studies of how these sites are organized, not between individuals, but within an individual or within pedigrees. This is the inheritance of somatic variation. And as I had alluded to at the beginning of my talk, these are the last frontiers for the human genome. These are huge gaps in our assemblies, and therefore understanding the sequence variants that exist in these genomes are really essential for our attempts to complete the genome. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the satellite DNAs in human centromeres, I'm going to give a brief background. Um, human centromeres, or at least all normal human centromeres, in the human genome are defined by alpha satellite. This is a 171 base pair repeat um, that has a wide range of sequence identity. If you had, for example, a collection of these repeats and you were to draw two out at random, you could find that they could have a percent identity difference of about 60%. That means you've got a lot of divergence to play with. If you're looking at my slide and you see four repeats listed here, one, two, three, and four, what I'm trying to indicate is that there's sufficient nucleotide divergence between repeat one and repeat two to tell them apart. And so the challenge here, of course, is when we start to see how these highly divergent monomers or the repeat units, as I'm showing you here, one through four, are organized in these multi-monomeric repeat units or what we call as higher order repeats. These higher order repeats or collection of divergent monomeric repeats um, have a very narrow range of percent identity. We're talking about 94 in a good day, but typically when you look at the percent identity between repeats, you're closer to 98 to 100%. And this is absolutely why our attempts to assemble through these multi-megabase regions fail. And it's not enough to teach yourself the structure and repeat organization of one centromere and start to move into all the other ones in the human genome. For example, on chromosome three, we might have two very different arrays, which I'm labeling here as array B and array C, versus chromosome X, which may have a different repeat structure labeled as array A. And even within a single centromeric region, um, that particular tandem repeat has its own set of variants. Here I'm trying to show you once again the higher order repeat. This time I'm showing you the individual 171 repeat units as circles. And you can have expansions. In other words, a single high order repeat could break off to make a, a truncated copy, and that can be expanded and contracted. And you could also find that within a single array, you can have structural variants such as the transposable elements, which I introduced earlier, rearrangements that are sporadic throughout the array, as well as inversions within the array itself. And so what we'd like to do is to, to take this model of centromere organization and try to develop new computational tools to be able to study um, this array, study the arrays themselves, and also categorize the type of variants that are located within each of the arrays. In doing that, I teamed up with some talented scientists to develop Alpha Centauri, which the GitHub link is here um, if you'd like to access it directly. And this particular tool um, is used to study the patterns of satellite repeats. Here I'm just showing you kind of a general schematic of how it works. But essentially, if you had a run of tandem repeats, you can use a profiler to characterize repeats that are similar to one another, for example, repeats A, B, C, and D. And then you can look at the distance or the spacing between these different clustered types based on sequence identity to predict the patterns of higher order repeats. Now, I've done um, Alpha Centauri assessments of a number of error-corrected PEC bio data sets. Here I'm showing you one. This is the GM12878. This is a female um, lymphoblastoid line that's from Seth pedigree. And on her X array, she has a predominant high order repeat, which has 12 of these 171 base pair monomers. And what I'm trying to show you in the donut plot is that this 12-mer is the predominant sequence that I see within this individual's array. More than 99% of all the tandem repeats in an array appear to have this particular configuration when we look at regular um, patterns in her, in her array. And when you start to look across a panel of individuals, we find that, in fact, is true. This type of regularity seems to be quite um, a central feature for the X centromere. However, when you start to look across other centromeres, this may not be the case. For example, if we look at centromere 10, um, we find that there's a, a number of these different higher order repeat patterns that seem to be expanding and contracting, as well as centromere 17. And this was really nice as an internal control because we had previous literature to, that would suggest that there are these types of higher order repeat sequence polymorphisms that are expected within these particular arrays, and the repeat predictions that I was making using Alpha Centauri actually align with these types of concordant uh, previous data sets. 
In total, there are 36 of these common higher order repeats that are found in the human genome that have been able to characterize here. I'm showing you these repeats broken down once again by their um, centromere location, as well as their repeat, their pr predominant canonical repeat periodicity. And you can see instantly from this particular snapshot that some of the arrays have a lot more um, variation than others. And once again, there's been an extensive amount of previous analysis on these satellite repeats. And so by digging into GenBank and pulling out these previously characterized satellite arrays um, as a positive control, I'm here showing you that these satellite arrays can be very concordant with what's previously shown in the literature. Now, of course, not all of them have been studied before, so I had to go through and actually do validation to show, for example, one array that was found on um, Centromere 3, which is a 10 mer repeat, in fact, maps to chromosome 3 by FISH. I could show that its periodicity can be um, validated by Southern. Also, you can study on how common these particular arrays are, so I've been screening through Coriol diversity panels to show that they're, in fact, quite common in the human population and showing that their um, array sizes match what I'm expecting using 1,000 genome population match data sets. Now, once you have extensively described these types of higher order repeats in the human population, you can begin to build a database of all the structural variants that exist within the arrays. Here, I'm trying to remind you of the structural variants that I introduced earlier in my talk. For example, you have the higher order repeat, which is the canonical version, but you also have interruptions by transposable elements, which are shown in green, inversions, which I'm highlighting in the black box with these inverted arrows with um, blue and red, and also these higher order rearrangements where you have the canonical repeat that can be um, rearranged between different individual monomers. Now, one way you can begin to show this type of information is using something called a genome graph, which I'm showing here. For example, the higher order repeat on the X chromosome is known to have 12 of these individual monomers. So you can begin to show all 12 monomers as the nodes and the edges between the monomers to be their uh, five prime to three prime um, orientation or the directionality between them. And because this is a tandem repeat, as you go from monomer one to monomer two, all the way to monomer 12, you um, find yourself in a head-to-tail um, orientation again, so it forms these types of cycles. Now, all of the individual nodes have a single nucleotide database, so I mix in with these particular data sets all the Illumina data that's available for these PAC biomatch data sets. For example, GM12878 is an aluminum data with a 200x platinum data set, so I'm able to do coverage-based estimates of copy number variants um, within the array as well. These higher order rearrangements, for example, if you're going from monomer one, two, and then it transitions into nine, I can also begin to study these particular uh, rearrangements relative to the canonical repeat. Here I'm showing that type of rearrangement in the, um, the graph below where you see monomer two then has a separate edge, which shows about 5% of the time going into this um, monomer nine. And so then you can begin to build these exhaustive graphs to describe the organization within the array. This is also true of inversions, as I'm showing you here. You can get high-resolution base pair um, descriptions of how these arrays are organized by mapping precise sites of inversions, as well as the TE elements, um, where you can actually begin to map um, quite, quite precisely the frequency of TEs and, and their insert size, and also the potential for expansion. As I'm showing here for centimeter 5 underscore 1, this is an array on chromosome 5 where I find that there is a line one insertion, but it's also um, expanded out. So it seems like it's taken part of the, the tandem repeat description. So now once you have this kind of comprehensive study of satellite repeat sequences and variants, can you actually use this information to guide true linear assemblies of satellite arrays? And the way you could do this in any number of ways, one could use um, high quality, low sequences linked reads. But the way I'm going to present today is using what we call ultra long reads. These are the reads that are produced by the Nanopore sequencing platform that are capable of reaching hundreds of kilobases in length. And the reason why I was particularly interested in this is that I was part of a very talented team that published the first Nanopore sequencing of a human genome back in 2018. And it was at that time that Josh Quick and Nick Lillman had released their ultralong protocol on the MedIon, where they showed that you could, um, at that point, re um, reach in 50s of 100 um, kilobases in length. And by doing so, we could begin to study some of these regions of the human genome that had previously um, been left off of our assemblies because they were too repetitive. 
In addition to that, I had been leading a team to try to provide the first linear assembly of a human centromere on the Y chromosome. The strategy that we took at that time um, was actually using something called back DNA. Um, this is essentially a high molecular weight DNA, typically in the range of 200 to 300 kilobases that are cloned into a circular vector. Um, what we designed was this assay of where we could linearize the back by cutting it once and then running it through the nanopore device and so we could get full length reads. Um, these are reads that span the entirety of the insert. But now you have a unique um, site on either side of the back insert, which I'm trying to show you in red, so you can begin to anchor and then take, rather than assembly, you're just mainly taking the consensus of these full length reads. We go through a series of polishing steps to reach a high quality consensus sequence of each of these backs. In doing this, we created a protocol that we released called Longboard 1D. Um, essentially, it takes, once again, the back DNA, we linearize it with this transposon complex. We do ligation with sequencing adapters and tethering attachment, and then we run it directly at the time through the minion. In doing so, we were able to recapitulate the entire length of the back, which is what I'm trying to show you here for this RP11648J18, where we know by pulse fold size estimates to be roughly 198 um, kilobases, and that's what we we're finding here as well when we start to map the, the read length we we're getting out. Now, there was previously a study by Tilford et al. back in 2001 where they had a collection of nine backs that were known to span the human Y centromere, so we selected this as our pilot study. Um, and we also focused on the Y centromere for several other reasons. Not only did we have kind of this um, collection of backs that we knew mapped uniquely to the Y centromere, the Y centromere has a very well characterized physical map going into this. It's a small haploid array, so it's the natural place to start um, to try to optimize some of these newer sequencing technologies. And it had a very well characterized 5.8 kilobase repeat. And the goal here was really to sequence the backs to the highest quality that we could, and then do just overlap layout assembly using single copy sequence variants. Here I'm just trying to show you our full length sequencing of the centromere Y backs. In total, we generated over 3,500 of these reads that were greater than 150 kilobases in length. Here I'm focusing on one back that was 209 kilobases. Um, in this particular back, I'm highlighting the cloning vector as being in red, and the back insert is in, is in gray. And all the tandem arrays of these Y centromere satellite DNAs, which are roughly 5.7 kilobases in length, are shown as the blue arrows. The single nucleotide variants, which are useful for assembly, are highlighted in purple. And the way that we um, qualified these particular variants as being single copy is by looking at the single copy distribution that we found in the back sequence. For example, we did Illumina resequencing in all of the same backs, so we could build a KMER-based distribution of the um, cloning vector, which we knew we had a single copy per experiment, and then we could take the same type of KMER-based estimates or KMER depth of the satellite DNAs, and we could identify those KMER depths that match the single copy estimates that we observed in the back cloning vector. Using these um, KMERs that we observed to be single copy, we could go through and create these unique anchors. I'm focusing in now on um, uh, repeat 30 and repeat 35 of our assembled array and emphasizing that we not only had to find evidence of Illumina data to support these were single copy on one back, but all of the backs that we looked at, and they had to be within the same position when we looked at the overlap um, ordering of the backs. So now that you have your predicted array, the important thing is to move into validation. I think this is something that's critically important for scientists to think about, because we haven't had to actually validate anything this big. The Y assembly, as we mentioned, was a little bit easier because it's one of our smaller arrays. Um, so but the problem um, always arises with how do you begin to study if the prediction of your assembly is correct. Um, here we took into account because we're working with the back library, which did not have a matched cell resource. So we found all of the Y haplogroup matched males in the 1,000 genome data, and we found their average array size to show that the array assembly that we predicted was in the right range of what we would expect. Also, we selected a Y haplogroup matched male, and we did pulse fold gel estimates to show that, in fact, our array estimates were very close to what we would have expected um, if we did have a cell line for this particular individual. Also, I want to emphasize that the centromere is defined epigenetically, and so in order to define that we are in 
fact, mapping the centromere, we performed um, centromere protein A, which is a histone variant that's specific for kinetochore assembly, ChIP-seq in this region to show that, yes, in fact, this region does bind or does, is involved with kinetochore assembly and is defined by the centromere shown here for the entirety of the array. So now that we had this long read protocol and we also had a, our first kind of prototype of being able to complete a centromere, the question arose, is it possible now to extend this to complete the entire human genome? Um, this was something I was very excited about as a satellite DNA biologist, thinking about the potential of actually seeing a lot of these um, satellite DNAs and, and their uh, multi-megabase view. At the same time, uh, my collaborator and co-lead on the telomere to telomere consortium, Adam Philippi, um, was also motivated to complete the human genome. So this was a very natural collaboration for us, and together we formed the telomere to telomere consortium. Now, this is a very unique consortium. I hope the audience uh, appreciates in the fact that it's an open, community-based effort with the single goal to generate the first complete assembly of the human genome. Um, anyone can join, anyone can contribute, and at the end of my talk, I'll provide details about how um, you can get in touch. Now, the genome that we decided to focus on initially was a, is a complete hydrotherful mole. Um, just to give you kind of a background for those of you who don't have um, experience with this particular type of cell line, um, typically when we think about um, fertilization, we think about having a maternal genome and a paternal genome. Um, however, these particular cells were derived from an accident of where the whole entire maternal genome was lost. And this either happened before or after fertilization. However, the paternal genome um, did come into the, into the egg and you had this effective duplication of the paternal genome. So you're now working with an effectively haploid line, meaning it's still 46 chromosomes. However, all of the chromosomes are expected to be identical. So now you, you've bypassed some of the challenges that you'd have to work with when you're looking between maternally and paternally inherited chromosomes of satellites where they're expected to be quite different. The particular cell line that we're working with is a hydrotherful mole CHM13. Um, this was a cell line that had been previously immortalized and established by a Vershi Serti, as I'm showing you here. Um, in addition, this particular cell line had um, was included as the platinum reference genome by WashU and University of Washington. So we had the benefit of PAC bio reads and Illumina data sets, and I had already constructed a satellite database of, to describe all the satellites in this particular genome. I then reached out and teamed out with some very talented scientists to look at the cytogenetics and the structure of these particular chromosomes to ensure that we weren't looking at a, a cell line that was unstable or had any types of aneuploidy and was relieved to find that CHM13 appeared to be very stable um, and that we found no types of uh, chromosome instability that would complicate our analysis and, and assuming that it was in fact effectively haploid. So the next question is, now that we have this stable, highly qualified um, line, can we then begin to generate high coverage of ultra-long sequence and try to put the human genome together? And one might stress that it's really important at this point to sequence deeply, and that's because even though you're generating these ultra-long data sets, you still have a fraction of reads that are coming out that are small. And so you have to reach high coverage in order to reach these really long reads that are capable of spanning a, a repeat of interest. And so we've been doing this for quite some time. Um, we started back in May, and we've only recently, in fact, um, stopped sequencing with the ultra-long CHM13. Um, at the time when we were starting to, to first do our, our release two, which um, we've posted and, and people can now have access to, we were describing 62 of these min-ion flow cells, um, roughly 8.9 megabases, or a million reads, or 98 gigs, um, which 1.6 gigs per cell. Flow cell, our N50 were about 76 kilobases. We have 44 gigs of greater than 100 KB, and our max length was over a megabase. This is really, um, although we're emphasizing using these really long reads, this is a multi-platform sequencing approach of where we took in every type of sequencing technology that we could to kind of emphasize the quality of our final assembly. So not only will we be talking about the Nanopore Ultralong, um, but we also use for contig building the 60X available PAC bio data set. We also use PAC bio for polishing. Um, we are using 10X genomics um, for polishing and bio nano for structural variation and validation. 
So here's a familiar picture from the human genome of 2001, um, where I'm showing you a human um, karyotype or ideogram where the black and gray are showing the changes between broken contigs. So as you move from black to gray, you're moving from different contig views. This is where we are today using the canoe assembly on our, um, we're reaching contig levels now of 75 uh, megabases for NG50, and this is using 35X coverage of ultra long data. And we decided to, to focus on the ecstasy if we could complete um, the assembly, a telomere to telomere assembly of a first human chromosome. Now, the human chromosome by Ross et al. had been previously characterized to have 14 different sites that had been unfinished or difficult to close. Um, here I'm showing you the sites that required at the initial stages manual gap closure as well as corrected repeat collapses, um, repeat regions. Many of these, as you might notice, are mapping to segmental duplications, which I'm trying to mark here as SD. Um, many of them are actually less than 200 kilobases, and as we had a or a fraction of our reads were in fact greater than 200 kb, it's then possible to anchor uniquely on either side and then take the consensus, thereby um, bypassing the need for doing um, these types of repeat assemblies which can lead to misassembly or collapse. I'm also trying to demonstrate on the slide, giving credit, of course, to Sergey Quillen, who did a, a lion's share of the assembly and also um, played a big role in, in doing a lot of the manual. Um, closure and, and collapse characterization with me as well. Um, we use BioNano to go through and try to study um, inconsistencies with some of our manual predictions to begin to, to finalize and to finish some of these regions, as well as we brought in digital droplet PCR to validate some of our um, copy number estimates for the tandem repeats. Now, one of our pr perhaps crowning achievement is, is finishing the, a centromere. So not just the smaller centromeres we performed for the Y, but one of these multi-megabase sized centromeres. And to do so, we really took into account this unique structural variants that were available to us from PacBio, as well as unique KMERS that were confirmed by duplex -seek. But I really want to emphasize that the assemblies that we're producing are really a hypothesis. And in order to, to have something we consider finished or a true telomere to telomere assembly takes validation. Now, the X centromere was a great place for us to start because I would argue it provides one of the best hypotheses. Um, we knew a lot, just as we did for the Y array, we knew a lot about the repeat class that was defining the particular X centromere. Um, this was characterized back in 1983 to be a 2KB repeat um, known as DXZ1. We also knew from over a decade of work of pulse flow gel estimates, the range of the array sizes of this particular repeat um, and also, this particular centromere had the most high-resolution genomic and genetic definition of any human centromere. So it was a natural place to start and, and arguably um, the place for us to really dive in and see how well we can perform in, in doing this type of complicated assembly. And so using this type of variant overlap that I introduced uh, for the Y array, we were able to predict a 2.8 megabase assembly of the X centromere. I then teamed up with two very talented scientists, Beth Sullivan and Jennifer Gurton, who worked with me to develop a pulse gel digital droplet assay to investigate the array length and composition and organization of the array. What I'm trying to show you in this slide, for example, is that we have pulse gel southern. This is where you isolate the array and you take a, a probe that you know maps specifically to the X-ray to try to size it. So we have size-based estimates for four different lines. We can take the same genomic DNA and run digital droplet PCR and demonstrate that we're able to predict the same type of array link. So in black is the postable gel southern, and in gray is the digital droplet PCR. And what you can probably see by eye is that you see this nice concordancy between the two validation experiments. And CHM13 is at the end, and we're finding our predictions are 2.8 megabases, which is nice because it matched our simple prediction as well. Also, we've been writing through with the postal gels to try to um, here I'm showing you one restriction enzyme, which is BST2, um, where we're seeing fragments that are at 1.8 megabase, 7 megabases, and 3 megabases. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 0.7 megabases, 0.3 megabase. And that, when we actually look for the same restriction sites within the array, we find, once again, concordancy with these estimates as well. Now, the end, we've been focusing a lot on the structural variants. These are the bigger variants, which are rearrangements, inversions, and transposable elements, but there's also single nucleotide variants. And so in order to capture that information, I've been working closely with Rosanna Risk at the University of Washington here in Seattle um, to study 
the, the variants using this high quality CRISPR-Cas9 duplex seq, where we designed CRISPR-Cas9 guides specifically to the X centromere array and began to study the these high quality repeat variants within the array as well to help us um, study and, and anchor more uniquely these long read sequences. So for example, now that you have an entire assembly of an X centromere, you can break it down into a K-mer map. You can identify which K-mers are now um, uniquely mapping or unique signatures, and you can use those unique signatures to begin to re-anchor the long reads to improve polishing. And this work is ongoing, but it's been led by Arang Ri um, from Adam Philippi's group, but it also serves as another nice method of validation because we can begin to study um, the reads and how they align to these particular regions for any signatures of collapse or rearrangements that would suggest that something's wrong with the array. Now, what are we learning? Um, so far, it's been quite interesting as you start to get into an array that's almost three megabases in length, the directionality of the repeats seems very non-random. We find that they go in one direction without any inversions for the X which also matched our packed bio data sets for this particular genome. Transposition events, um, if you're counting on that for assembly, I think that's uh, maybe not the right place to be because they're few and far between. Um, we only found evidence for one line 1HS in the X-ray. And conversion can take place over long distances. So some of these um, higher order rearrangements that I was tracking um, I expect it to be very close to one another, but in fact, some of them are greater than a megabase away. But perhaps the, what we're going to learn is yet to come because it's really by constructing these really high resolution, high quality maps that we can begin to move into a new world where we can begin to map um, epigenetic and transcriptional information to begin to study, much like what the ENCODE project uh, tried to do, more of this type of SIN code or, or trying to understand functional relationships between epigenetic, transcriptional, and also the underlying genomics. Now, from the beginning of my talk, I emphasize that it's insufficient really to study one human genome because these regions are known to vary. And so we need to move away from that in order to study how study and, and track sequence variants that exist within this region in the human population. As I'm showing you here, once again, for a heterochromatic allele um, on chromosome one, you can really see these from space. We know they exist. And in order to really track them, we're going to have to move into a world where we have long read sequencing um, across multiple individuals. So there's really this new need for high coverage, ultra long read sequencing in order to move into a more comprehensive study of human variants. But of course, five genomes seems obtainable, but to, in order to reach this kind of population view, we need to really move into hundreds of individuals. And that introduces kind of a technological bottleneck where we know long read sequencing um, is expensive and time consuming. And not only that, it takes into account the compute, um, the assembly and, and the validation work that goes into it. So we need to be able to, to rapidly address that. So at UC Santa Cruz, we've been trying to work through this particular challenge. Um, we're testing um, moving into long read sequencing on the Promethean. This is a sequencing platform offered once again by the Oxford Nanopore. It really hit three of our main criteria moving forward. One is that we wanted to have the capacity to scale. As I mentioned, having these really long sequences are, are incredibly useful, but we want to be able to do it for hundreds of genomes. And the nice thing about the Promethean is that it offers um, the capacity to run 48 of these types of flow cells at once. You can really um, do long read sequencing in a parallel manner. Also, if we want comprehensive genome representation, we want these 100 KB reads to be um, enriched. And so far, the Promethean platform is the only sequencing platform that's shown the capacity to actually reach a megabase. Um, so we, we emphasized going on the Promethean for the opportunities to be more comprehensive. And finally, we're testing this platform to see if it can have consistency, consistency between runs, consistency and quality, and also if it's scalable um, to allow the assembly applications that we have downstream. So our goal was to sequence 11 human reference genomes in nine days. I'm breaking down the, uh, the, the pie chart here to give you kind of a feel for how this was accomplished. The biggest chunk of time was the long read sequencing as well as base calling. And um, we then went to assembly, polishing, and then scaffolding. Here I'm showing you kind of a, a pipeline of what we did. We have our sequencing and base calling being performed um, in, at UC Santa Cruz on our Promethean. We're using the flip-flop base caller. Um, we also have, in, then we enter into the Amazon Web Service. We go into the cloud and we start doing assembly, polishing, scaffolding. And of course, we're going to, it's not a finished genome until we phase. So we're moving into um, updating this particular pipeline into a phased diploid assemblies. 
Now I want to emphasize that all of the steps that I'm showing you here. Um, we are currently using Hangli's WTBG2. Um, we're polishing using Raycon four times with Medaka. This is the proposed polishing step from the Oxford Nanopore um, team, as well as scaffolding in collaboration with Ed Green's group using high C data and Dovetail's high rise software. Now I want to emphasize that all of these um, components are modules. So as we improve on assembly, we improve on polishing, we improve on scaffolding, all of these can be entered in, but essentially we're trying to get it to where you load um, the sequencer and you, you have this kind of really streamlined process to get to a finished assembly, which is what one needs to have in order to have the consistency and speed to reach hundreds of genomes. Also, as I mentioned, it's not only about um, just the sequencing component alone. We want to have a more comprehensive look. So we needed to have a sequencing strategy that enriched for ultra long reads, what I'm calling these UL reads. Um, in doing so, we've been using the standard high molecular weight DNA prep that was offered from um, Oxford Nanopore. This is something that had been illustrated for the Clivome. Um, and that's what I'm showing you kind of in this darker tan. Um, region. In addition to that, we matched up with circulomics and we used a short read eliminator kit. Essentially, if you were to include short reads into the nanopore sequencing platform, um, some of these smaller reads are, are sequenced preferentially. But if you were able to decrease them or eliminate them using the short read eliminator kit, you can effectively increase the tail of read links, which I'm showing you here. And that's exactly what we found. Um, when using this kit, we actually had an enrichment of 100 KB plus reads. And we could detect that overall when we put our overall boost of coverage when we started looking across the individuals in our study, that we would have this increase now of 100 KB reads. Now, for every individual in our study, we have one genome um, was sequenced on three flow cells. Each flow cell used three libraries. And what I'm showing you here is the combination of those three flow cells. And so for a single individual, our average N50 was 44. Um, kilobases. I'm showing you our distribution plots for the read links with the 100 KB plus shown in dark blue and things that are less than 10 KB shown in gray. On your right, you can see the overall coverage for all of the genomes that we're working with and the total number of gigs that we're able to acquire on this platform. And in the darker shading, what I'm trying to highlight is the number of 100 KB reads. On average, we're looking at about 7.3 X coverage um, per genome that we're able to get using this strategy. Also, we have been evaluating the read accuracy. When we started, we were using a non-flip-flop model. This is the base color that's been issued by Oxford Nanopore. Um, essentially, when we use flip-flop, we're finding that we're in a mode of 91% identity with a median of about 88. But important for us, because we know that this base color is always going to improve and we're going to get better and better, is really the consistency between flow cell replicates. As I mentioned, there are three flow cells per individual, and we can begin to show that we're seeing true um, high resolution and consistency between runs, which is exactly what we want when we're scaling up. Now, at the beginning of my talk, I really introduced this telomere to telomere consortium. Um, that was, once again, emphasizing this high coverage, ultra long data set. It took us six months to generate the data that I showed to you, 62 of the Menion flow cells. In total, we had 50X coverage with N50s around seven kilobases and 44 gigs of 100 KB plus. And at the end of my talk, what I'm saying is that for a single individual now, it can take you four days um, running on three Promethean flow cells. You can reach about 70x coverage on average with the N50 is about 44 kilobases. And we're looking at about 7x coverage of ultra long. So you can easily imagine how scaling up the flow cells, um, you can get the same amount of ultra long sequencing in a very short amount of time um, for much less money. So we're, we're trying to optimize to reach the telomere to telomere standards, um, but in a more, uh, in a way that can lead to a larger number of fully resolved diploid genomes. And so in doing this, I've been taking all of the diversity information from these high resolution ultra long data sets and building a satellite diversity atlas. Um, this is once again, the same type of graph based representation that I introduced at the beginning of my talk to study satellite array variants and their frequency across diverse human genomes. This is in collaboration with the pan human reference team that we have at UC Santa Cruz that's been developing a number of VG tools um, in order to build these types of sequence graphs. And our satellite variant map version one, um, that includes all of the thousand genome data sets and the error corrected PEC bio panels. But we also now have these ultra long data sets where you can begin to study a panel of diverse diploid genomes, um, as well as looking through uh, genomes that we know are, are related to one another through 
uh, trios or pedigrees from the genome in the bottle data sets. And we're now moving into panels of, of complete high telephone moles as an extension of the telomere to telomere project. So I want to emphasize my enthusiasm for this being a new era for satellite DNA genomics. I think this is an exciting place to be, and I think that this is with the goal of reaching these telomere to telomere assemblies, is really understanding how to traverse and validate to produce these high quality finished maps that will get us to a more clear and comprehensive understanding of the human genome. And with that, I'll go ahead and thank my collaborators. I've got uh, one slide dedicated to my collaborators and my colleagues at UC Santa Cruz, the Genomics Institute, in particular, David Hausler, and Benedict Patton and Mark Akinson, and Ed Green. Justin Zook had, uh, in collaboration, contributed towards our NIST analysis for the genomes for and a bottle consortium. Um, in addition, I'd like to emphasize our telomere to telomere team, in particular, Adam Philippi, who's my co-lead in the project, and like I mentioned, it's time to finish the human genome. And so all of our data has an open release. Please check us out online, join our group, and we'll be happy to work with you to try to finish the human genome. And with that, thank you very much for your time. And I'll be happy to take any questions by email um, after the talk. Thank you.